Welcome to Broadway Church Online. We are so glad you've joined us today. My name is Victor, and you have joined us on week six of our Lifehack Sermon Series, Practical Solutions to Everyday Problems. In just a few moments, Pastor Meg will be sharing a great message with us. But before we continue, I would love for you to share this video as it really does help spread what God is doing here at Broadway Church. And if you had not yet subscribed to our channel, we really encourage you to do this now and you'll always be in the loop with all the content here at Broadway Church. In just a few moments, the worship team is gonna come and lead us in a time of worship. But before that happens, we wanna show you a quick recap of our Easter batch that took place just a couple weeks ago. Let's watch this video together. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Desiree and I am the Young Adults Pastor here. And as you guys can see, I have a very special guest with me. So why don't you tell us who you are and what you do around here? Hey guys, my name is Carl and I'm one of the leaders for the Filipino ministry. Nice, and Carl, how long have you been attending Broadway Church? I've been attending Broadway since I was four years old, since 1995. That's amazing, so that's like maybe 28 years. So you attended Sunday school here when you were a child. I did, and I also have a daughter. I'm looking forward to having her volunteer with me here at Broadway Church soon. Aw, that's amazing. That is Broadway legacy right there. Well, we have a ton of stuff happening here at Broadway for you and your families. So why don't you check these things out? Speaking of our Filipino ministry, we will be celebrating our 32nd anniversary. It's happening on April 30th at the Vancouver campus from 1 to 3.30 p.m. Tickets are for sale at the Automated Giving Center, so please purchase those as soon as possible, as spots are limited. Happy anniversary to the Filipino ministry. If you're a young adult, you are invited to our monthly service called The Gathering. This is a great place to meet other young adults in our community and get connected. We will be meeting this Thursday, April 27th at 7 p.m. at The Warehouse, which is the building next to the Vancouver campus. Check out the website for more details. We are excited to be hosting six weeks of summer day camps at City Reach's Out of School Care Program. The camps are happening on the weeks of July 3rd to August 11th. Each day is going to be packed with crafts, games, field trips, and lots of fun activities. The cost is $385 per week per child. And for more information, please check out our website. 
please pray for our Mexico short-term missions trip as they leave this upcoming week. Myself and 11 others are going to be serving the children at the Foundation for His Children Ministry Center in Oaxaca, Mexico. Pray for us that God would give us energy and joy as we connect the children, serve well, and show the love of Jesus to others. Our summer kids camp in Vancouver is quickly approaching. This camp is for kids ages four to grade eight. We are hoping to accept 300 children for this camp, but we need your help. Please consider serving with us this summer. Camp is happening July 17th to 21st, and the time commitment is 8 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. You can also choose specific days to volunteer if you can't make it all week. To sign up, visit the Kids and Family section of the website or email Pastor Megan. We have a preteen event at the Vancouver campus this Friday night, April 28th from 7 to 9 p.m. We're gonna be making bracelets and origami, playing games as well as dodgeball and crab soccer. It's going to be an amazing night. This is open to preteens at all campuses. The cost is $5, so please register your child online under the preteen section of the website. If you missed anything that we said, you can always visit our website, broadwaychurch.com, for more information on all of our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Well, good morning, church. I hope you're excited to be here. Why don't you stand? We're going to start with singing a couple of songs together, so let's worship our God and give Him the praise that He deserves. Let's go.
sun Set our eyes on the Savior See the image of love Sing His praises forever Oh, we look to the sun into color at the speed of light freedom shaking up the atmosphere as the shadows fade into nothing and the day appears beyond the skies above love reaching out Sun. Now forever, lifted up from death to life There's no fear in love and no darkness in His endless light Jesus, beyond the skies above Love reaching out for us, the everlasting Reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Sing it again. Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Things you've done before in greater measure. 
measure you will do again Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through No mountain you can move All things are possible And there's no broken body you can raise No soul that you can't save All things are possible The darkest night you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, you've already won, oh God of revival, you rose in victory. Now you're seated forever on your throne. So why should my heart fear what you defeated? I will trust in you alone. Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through. No mountain you can't move on things are possible cause there's no broken body you can raise no soul that you can't save oh, things are possible the darkest night you can light it up you can light it up Sing this together. Come awaken your people. Come awaken the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. And every stronghold will crumble. Sing it out. Oh God of revival. Chain hit the ground Oh God of revival Pour it out Pour it out Pour it out The darkest night You can light it up Come on Oh God of revival Let hope arise Death is overcome
Every stronghold will crumble I hear the chain hit the ground Oh God of revival Pour it out Pour it out
this morning, friend. Do you believe that? We believe in unshakable, unfathomable, unconditional love that Jesus Christ gives to each and every one. Here at Broadway Church, we believe in spiritual gifts and someone came and had a picture and maybe this is you today and you feel like you're in a prison. You look at your life, you look at your mirror in the morning and all you see is bars in a prison. And you've tried to get out of that prison. You've done in all of your power to try to get out of that prison. And this prison represents bitterness and resentment. It might unfortunately represent self-hate and self-destructive thoughts. Do you know that today the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who is unshakable, wants to speak life to you today? Do you know the one who was raised from the dead that we celebrated a week ago in Easter now lives in you and can raise you from the dead that can take away the powers of sin and darkness to fling out those doors that you have been trying to wrestle with and find wholeness and freedom in him? Is that you? I wanna pray with you. If that's you on our online campus, our Surrey campus, our Port Coquitlam campus, we're gonna pray for the unshakable God, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the mega, to fling out the doors and to speak healing into your life and into our nation, into our cities and into our families, into our neighborhoods and communities and schools. God of revival, revive us. Let's pray. Lord, every single heart is crying out to you today that's represented in this room that perhaps is living in a prison of bitterness and resentment and self-hate or self-destructive thoughts. Lord, would you open up the prison doors and rather than them trying to deal with things on their own power and their own way, that they would submit and surrender to you today that you would reveal their, your love to them, that you would reveal your grace to them, that they would experience the, the power of the living King that could heal us and make us whole and set us free from the powers of sin because you are the beginning and the end. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You're the King of all Kings and the Lord of all Lords. And I pray for all of us today that this would be more than just a song, but this would be a way of life because the gospel has given us victory in every area of our lives. And we pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Broadway Church and thank you worship team for leading us in worship today. If you're new to Broadway Church, we would love for you to fill out our digital in-touch card. Just scan the QR code on the screen and fill out the form. A pastor will get back to you and help you find answers to your questions about growing in your faith or connecting here at Broadway. We are now going to transition into our time of giving. If you're new to Broadway Church, please feel under no obligation to give. You do not have to pay to watch or attend church. However, if you would like to financially support what God is doing here at Broadway, we would love for you to do that now. Our preferred way of giving is for you to go to the Give tab on the website and check out the online banking giving option. We can accept your credit card over the phone if you call the church office. You can come in in person from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. during the week if you want to drop it off. And you can also use text to give. If you text the word give to the number on the screen, it'll walk you through the prompts to get set up. Or finally, you can mail checks to the church. We also want to help you by providing some discussion questions based on today's topic immediately after the sermon. As I mentioned earlier, Pastor Mick will be sharing from God's word with us in just a moment, but you still have time to share this video as it really does help us reach many more people and share the good news of Jesus. Thank you once again for tuning in with us.
The other day as I was driving to work, creeping along the number one, I started to do some math. Now my commute to work is 22 kilometers one way. Over the 14 years I've served here at Broadway, I have made over 5,000 trips back and forth. And before that, I spent the equivalent of a year of working hours commuting back and forth on some of Canada's busiest highways in the Metro Toronto area. The bottom line, I've spent a lot of time in traffic on the highway. I think I'm an experienced commuter. Now, when I'm all by myself on the road, it's pretty stress-free. But in heavy traffic, everything changes. Hundreds of cars are speeding in multiple lanes. In Vancouver, you have to navigate four lanes one way. On Toronto's 407, there can be as many as 18 lanes going one way. And changing lanes is a required skill if you're going to get anywhere at all. Now, I've changed lanes and I've watched a lot of lanes changed. But to be honest, lane changing kind of freaks me out. The reason is this driving reality. Every driver on the road has a blind spot where they cannot see every car around them. Often on the morning commute, I see Pastor Darren whip by me, jubilantly changing lanes, and I ask myself, how does he do that? Well, we recently upgraded our aging vehicles by purchasing a new one with this special feature called blind spot assistance. Listen, it's amazing. It lets you know who is next to you in the place just behind you where you cannot see. A light comes on, a bell sounds, and voila, you know that it is now safe to change lanes. Well, we're in a series that we have called Life Hacks, Practical Solutions to Everyday Problems. And our source book for the series is the first letter of Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. Now, Paul writes this letter to provide the Corinthian church some much needed blind spot assistance. Now, originally, this book did not have chapter and verse divisions when Paul wrote it. Chapters were added in the 13th century. Verses came later in the 16th century. But we're going to pick up Paul's block of thought that begins in chapter 3 and continues on into chapter 4. Now, the Corinthian followers of Jesus had a vision problem. The way they saw things, they had spiritually figured everything out. From their point of view, the Corinthians thought, we've got this. They had that kind of an attitude. Now, the real problem was that they had become experts in the slow lane when they should have been traveling in the HOV lane, and they didn't know they had a problem. So Paul writes them a hard and very honest letter to jar them out of their spiritual complacency. He writes to draw their attention to three blind spots that were stalling their growth in Jesus and their witness as a community of faith. You see, we don't just have blind spots when we're driving. We can also have blind spots when we're living. And when it comes to everyday living, what you and I can't see is a problem. And so Paul writes to give the Corinthians and us some blind spot assistance. How do I know that? Well, look at how Paul begins this section in chapter 3, verse 18. He says, do not deceive yourselves or let no one deceive himself. The members of the Corinthian church had responded to the gospel and were the recipients of some of the best preaching and preachers the early church had to offer. It wasn't that they didn't have faith in Christ. They did. The problem was that they hadn't matured in their faith. They were stuck in the early stages of discipleship. Their spiritual immaturity set them up to be deceived by confusing the wisdom of the world with the wisdom of God. And so Paul writes to provide some blind spot help to avoid three traps that could derail their young faith and damage the church's reputation. So what are the blind spots that can ruin our lives? Well, the first blind spot we're going to talk about, the first blind spot that Paul talks about is the blind spot of arrogance. And arrogance is thinking that you are wiser than you really are. This is what he writes. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. And as it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. 
So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Wow, there's an awful lot there. What is Paul saying? In one of his books, Eugene Peterson describes the wisdom of the age as bowing down to the new human trinity of my holy wants, my holy feelings, and my holy needs. To the worldly wise, life is all about me and how others can serve me. This is the gospel that is being preached by the celebrity culture that we live in today. The popular wisdom of celebrity culture is about finding meaning by aligning yourself with the right people, thinking like they think, doing what they do, looking like they look, wearing what they wear. The focus is on who to follow, and that was a problem for the church in the Corinthians. In Corinth, the rock stars were the preachers and leaders in the church. Apollos, Cephas, or Peter, Paul, different groups followed their favorite to the point that the church was divided in their loyalty. The downside of celebrity is being impressed uh, by influential people for the wrong reasons. And this just doesn't happen in the surrounding culture. It can also be a problem in church culture. The Corinthians had their favorite preachers and teachers. We do the same today, if we're honest. This kind of favoritism is foolishness compared with the wisdom of God. Because the wisdom of God is not centered on revering others, but on serving others and their needs from a heart of self-giving love. It's not about getting attention, applause, and affirmation. It's about giving of your time and talent and treasure to bless the lives of others. Having godly wisdom means that we strive to see life from God's perspective and to act accordingly. Worldly wisdom comes from the human effort to make life work with God on the sidelines. With worldly wisdom, we may become educated, street smart, and have common sense that enables us to play the world's game successfully. The problem with worldly wisdom is that it often gets corrupted by human selfishness and sinfulness. While the Corinthians had fallen into the trap of confusing godly and worldly wisdom, they mixed them up and were living accordingly. The problem with traps is that we usually don't see them and it's till it's too late. Now, Paul's point here is that worldly wisdom only goes so far. It doesn't compare with God's wisdom. It does not get you closer to God. The wise of the world have no advantage when it comes to being wise before God. The wisdom of this world passes away, but God's wisdom remains. And anything not in tune with God's thoughts is vain. The Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance, is impressed by the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. He sees people as they are, not as who they appear to be. Now, you might be able to fool all of the people all the time, but there's no fooling God because God knows everyone's thoughts. Nothing is hidden from him. He sees human wisdom for what it is, futile in the things that really matter ultimately and eternally. So, Paul admonishes the Corinthian believers to get off the celebrity bandwagon and to get their feet on the ground. Don't put your trust in men, even if it is Paul or Apollos. If you're going to make a big deal out of someone, get your eyes off men and focus on God. And then Paul takes an interesting turn in this passage. He says this, he says, by getting fixated on following one favorite person, you're actually forfeiting the benefit all God's service have to offer you. All of the blessings of God belong to the whole church, include the ministry of all of its leaders. Everything is for the believer's benefit. Every experience of life is for the believer's good. Everything should be viewed in relationship to God's plan and purposes for his people. Because we're not our own, we belong to God. And the Corinthians were acting as they were their own masters, whereas they really belong to Christ. That's what Paul is trying to remind them. Arrogance is out of character for those who belong to Jesus. What about you? Are you ever tempted to think that you're wiser or smarter than others? Do you live everyday life with your eyes on the right things? Would you describe yourself as worldly wise or wise in the eyes of God? If today you're suffering some wisdom deficiency or wisdom deprivation, the scriptures have a remedy for you and for me. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, 
He should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given him. But there's another troubling trap for which Paul sounds an alarm in our passage today. And the second blind spot is judgmentalism, and that is thinking you know more than you actually do. And this is what he writes. He says, so then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required of those who have been given a trust that they must prove faithful. Having been given a trust, they must be faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's heart. And at that time, each will receive his praise from God. Wow, Paul really knows how to pack a lot of things into one paragraph. So let's break this down. We all have a knowledge gap. The difference between what we do know and all there is to know. As human beings, we like to fill in this gap with our own meaning. And when we do, we can fall prey to becoming self-made experts with the confidence to pass judgment on others. But listen, we're not omniscient. One of the things that I often do when I am creeping along the number one is I listen to Vancouver Sports Radio. And what happens on Vancouver Sports Radio is that the fans call in to weigh in on their favorite players and their favorite teams. Now, the fan, and I can speak from integrity because I am one, has fans. We often don't know the players. We don't know about their life situation. We don't know the coaches. We don't know the owners. We don't really know um, the general managers. I mean, there's a whole lot that we don't know. But when we call in on sports radio, we all pretend that we are experts, that we know exactly what this player needs to do to improve and who's, who's not a good player, who is a good player, and you know, what the home team should be doing. We are all experts, and yet we really have very little knowledge. While the Corinthians felt that they were spiritually astute enough to call penalties on their God-given leadership, but they were fooling themselves. They did not have the inside track on the servants of God. They were taken up with the superficial. Their knowledge was only skin deep. Now then, as now, Picking and choosing which preacher or leader you prefer to follow is pointless based on how clever you feel they are, how dynamic they speak, how engaging they are, how attractive they are. Every leader God chooses is accountable to stand before God who called him or her. And only he is able to give a true and a valid judgment on them. And of course, that's true of all of our relationships. Paul and Apollos were committed and submitted servants of Jesus. And they were responsible to him and not the Corinthians. Their ministries didn't rise and fall on their opinion. So Paul says, don't make distinctions between people based on knowledge you don't have. Their calling is God's business, who alone has the inside track. God is their master and they are accountable to him. What the Corinthians think is of little consequence in the big picture of things. Because the mysteries of God cannot be appropriated by human wisdom. Only God can make them known. And God has entrusted this message, this message of the gospel to his servants to use to build up the church. And in this passage, Paul corrects the Corinthian skew view of leadership. And this is what he says, folks, listen, these people are not uh, celebrities, they are servants. All of your leaders have a stewardship given by God. Every one of your leaders, every one of your preachers are all communicators of God's revelation. And all of them have been called to be faithful to the calling God has given them. This is the kind of knowledge you need to appreciate godly leadership or godly preaching. When it comes to evaluating God's servants, listen, human wisdom is of little value because only God is qualified to hold his servants to account. And those who think they know what spirituality looks like and are qualified to judge others are deceiving themselves. That's Paul's point. Their job is not to stand back and to pass judgment, but to get on with being faithful in their own service for the Lord. The Corinthian church was trafficking in human judgment 
and Paul dismisses their assumed expertise. Listen, Paul does not even put much stock in the opinions of the people who pass judgment on him. In fact, Paul says he doesn't even bank on his own judgment. He says, I'm not aware of any deficiencies in my own service, but I'm not going to put any confidence in that because my knowledge is incomplete. Paul admits to the possibility of having a blind spot. And only God's judgment matters because only God has complete knowledge. People who try to take God's place put themselves at risk of becoming carping critics. And the poison of a critical spirit is assuming a perfect knowledge that the critic doesn't have. And where they have a gap in their understanding, they tend to make up fabricated disinformation to fill the gap in what they know. And people with a major on being critics and spiritual walk dogs are usually toxic in the church. So stop judging. Leave that to God who is alone qualified to do so. Don't presume to get ahead of God or that you know better than he does. In his time, he will bring to light what is hidden and the motives of men's hearts. Only God can see into these places and call these things for what they are. It's God's praise that matters, not the adulation of the crowd. So let me ask you, are you a fan of Jesus, but a follower of someone else other than Jesus? Are you as excited or dismayed when a leader falls off their popular pedestal? Maybe it's time for you and I both to admit that we don't always know all we need to know or all we think we know. Maybe it's time to ask more questions and make fewer accusations. Which brings us to the third blind spot that Paul raises in this passage. And it is the blind spot of pride. And pride is all about thinking that you are better than you are. Here's what Paul writes. He says, now brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, don't be gone, go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over another for who makes you different from anyone else? And what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? A superior attitude is about believing you are better than you are. And the more important or the more together you think you are, the greater the temptation to see yourself as superior. Now, pride lies at the root of this kind of thinking. You look around, you compare yourself to others, and you feel pretty good about yourself. And when you think you have it all together, there's an ever-present temptation to look down on those who don't. You can fall into the trap of looking down on others who don't think and act like you do, and anyone who disagrees is clearly mistaken. The Corinthians saw themselves as spiritually rich, so much so that they felt comfortable in giving report cards on the preachers and leaders that they had. They were so convinced in their choice that they were fighting with others who held a different opinion. The supporters of Apollos were going nose to nose with those who favored Paul and looking down on the rival camp, and their pride was dividing the community of faith in Corinth. The Corinthians had become addicted to pride. They felt they were the ones who had their spiritual act together. They felt self-sufficient and a kind of good time faith. And good time faith works really well as long as you are feeling blessed and confidence in your own spirituality. But life is about more than good times and what then? Paul wants the Corinthians and us not to be self-deceived. That's why he wrote this section. They didn't want anyone's help to decide who they were gonna follow. The Corinthians were acknowledging clear apostolic teaching on what Christian leadership was all about, and they were creating their own criteria, and in doing so, they were overstepping their authority. And Paul says, listen, it's a time for a wake-up call. Paul says in this passage, in effect, let me use Apollos and myself as an example so that you get what I'm saying. Listen, we are simply servants and stewards of the gospel, and one day we are going to give an account to God for our ministry. We're not celebrities. It's one thing to recognize good leadership, friends, but when your favoritism leads to fighting, you have clearly lost the plot. You should not take pride in some and despise others. That does not honor Jesus. The problem with pride is that it leads its possessor to assume a superior posture that has no basis in reality. And the reality for this church is that they had forgotten that everything that they have and are comes from God. And it has nothing to do with their personal standing or achievement. They owe everything to the grace of God. So boasting is foolish. The world traffics in boasting in one-upsmanship. 
But that is the very wisdom that God has called futile. There's no place for it in the church. And so to wrap up this passage, Paul drives the point home by dramatically challenging their conceit. The Corinthians thought they had reached full maturity to call things as they were. And Paul sits out to put a pin in that balloon. By the verdict of worldly wisdom, God's servants were treated as despised before the world, but the Corinthians felt they were way above that. And hear what Paul writes. Just listen to the tenor of it. Already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. You have become kings. And that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings so that we might become kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in an arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to the angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, but we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty, we are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless, we work hard with our hands. When we're cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become as the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Listen, do you see what Paul is doing here? He is using irony and contrast to call out the superior attitude of the Corinthians by comparing the lowly place of God's servants with all of their perceived advantages. He sets their good time faith that works when everything is working against a real time faith that can handle the adversity of the cause of Jesus. It's as if he was saying this. He's saying, you Corinthians, look at you, look at you. You're wise, you're strong, you're honored. Look at us, what are we? We are foolish, we're weak, we're dishonored by comparison. Wow, you are satisfied that you have all the spiritual blessing you need and lack nothing. And your pride has resulted in you being self-satisfied and self-sufficient. You don't think you need any instruction. In your mind, you've arrived. Listen, we wish that was true. Then we poor leaders could get on the same elevator that you're on. But here's the reality that the Corinthians were missing. There is a difference between good time faith and real time faith. There's a difference between being self-sufficient and God dependent. And their leaders were examples of the difference. Leaders have been called to serve in humility and in the various places that God calls them. There may be a serious lack of the world's applause, but they are commended by God himself. Jesus himself didn't come to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. This is real-time faith. It makes no sense by worldly wisdom, but this is how God works to seek and to save the lost. The apostles demonstrate their legitimacy as servants of God by what they are prepared to suffer to minister for God's people. They're operating from a different kind of wisdom than the world. The servants of God by the world standards are, are fools for Christ, fools to the world's way of thinking, but they are wise in the ways of God. This is real time faith. Corinthians, Paul says, you consider yourself wise in Christ and above all this, you think you're wiser than your leaders, but you're missing the point. You think you have it all together while God's servants are despised and considered weak. Well, check this out. We follow our calling, whatever the cost. We do whatever it takes to be true to our commission from God. We are leaders don't think that we are too good to serve in the humblest ways. We do not play by the rules of worldly wisdom. We're persecuted and reviled and slandered, but we do not respond in kind. Instead, what do we do? We bless, we entreat, we endure, we stay on task. Now, the Corinthians may boast about how good they are, but that is not the lot of God's obedient servants. They don't consider themselves too good to do the humble and popularly dishonored work of the gospel in the world in which we live. Because servants of God do not traffic in the wisdom of the world. They're sometimes canceled and considered throwaways. But their real-time faith enables them to find joy and purpose when times are good, but especially when times are not. There are three blind spots that can set us up for a personal and spiritual collision with reality. There are three blind spots that we do well to be aware of in our lives. The first one is arrogance, thinking that you are wiser than you really are. The second one is judgmentalism, thinking that you know more than you do. 
And the third one is pride, thinking you are better than you are. Listen, we can all be tripped up by any of these blind spots at any time. But arrogance is the blind spot that often gets in the way when we are younger and we think that we're smarter than everybody else. Judgmentalism is the blind spot that often accompanies us later in life when we think we've seen it all and know it all. Sometimes this can be a blind spot that will bite me. The blind spot of pride can bite us at any time in life. So which of these blind spots is blindsiding you right now? Maybe it's time for you to stop back and take a look at how you are living. Maybe today is your moment to take advantage of Paul's blind spot assistance. Now listen, I know that it's not politically correct today to even suggest that you are anything less than totally amazing or even to hint at the fact that you have any blind spots at all. It's offensive for many to even consider that they might have limitations. But Paul is not trying to be politically correct here as we've seen. He's calling the Corinthians and us not to deceive ourselves. He is jarring them and us to wake up to the reality about the story we are living in because the gospel tells a better story. And this leads us to our life hack, our practical solution to everyday problems. And here's today's life hack. The surest way to avoid self-deception is to give God your full attention. So how do we avoid being blindsided by our blind spots? Give your ear to the Spirit of God in you and not to the Spirit of the world around you. Refuse to be wowed by the crowd. Number two, ask more questions and make fewer judgments. Seek for knowledge. Don't assume you know it all. And number three, be willing to humble yourself so God doesn't have to. Because the surest way to avoid self-deception is to give God your full attention. Well, Paul has been saying some pretty hard things in this passage. Um, And they were hard for the Corinthians and even hard for us to understand. And you're thinking, you know, what is Paul? What is Paul's motive? Where is he going with this? Listen to what he writes in verse 14 of chapter 4. He says, I am not writing this to shame you, but to warn you, my dear children. Paul here is speaking the truth in love. It's time for the Corinthians to grow up. He deconstructs their faulty self-understanding, not to shame them, but to save them from a world of grief. Paul is not lashing out in anger about the way he's being treated by the Corinthians. He's providing them with valuable blind spot assistance so they might not miss out on all that they have in Christ. Maybe you have never made a commitment to follow Jesus. Maybe worldly wisdom is the only wisdom you know anything about. And today you're intrigued. You're thinking, wow, you know, my wisdom has only gone so far. I need the wisdom that comes from God. Well, the first step into appropriating that kind of wisdom is to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. And if that's where you are today, if you would like to accept Jesus Christ as Lord, if you would like to have his wisdom involved in your life, then pray this prayer with me. And today you can take uh, the first step in a whole new direction, open up a whole new chapter of your life. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this word from Paul. Lord, today as I've been listening, I realize I have a few blind spots of my own. They've caused me to ignore you and to hurt the people around me. And Lord, I realize that as much as I think I know, there's a lot of things I don't. And today, I'm not pretending anymore. I just want to invite you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life. Open my eyes, clarify my motives, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the wisdom I need to live purposefully day by day and moment by moment. Lord Jesus, come into my life, I pray. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me this morning, I wanna give you a couple of suggestions about what you can do next. If you've made this decision to follow Jesus, tell somebody about the decision that you've made. Or you can text the number on our screen and a pastor will get back to you as soon as you can to help you take the next step on your spiritual journey. We wanna come alongside and walk with you. Listen, it's great to have you at Broadway Church Online this week. And we hope you'll come back and join us again next week. Thank you for joining us at Church Online this week. If you have any prayer needs or requests, please text the number on the screen. Or if you're new to Broadway and you're looking to connect deeper, 
please scan the QR code on the screen and a pastor will reply and help you get connected to a place where you can best serve and grow. Here are the discussion questions you can use based on today's sermon. Have you ever experienced someone who ignore their blind spots? Share a story. How do these blind spots show up in your life? Which one of the blind spots do you need lane assistance with? Practically speaking, how do you deal with your blind spots? We pray that by engaging deeper into today's message, it will help you along in your spiritual walk. Lastly, don't forget to check out broadwaychurch.com for all the things going on at the church and have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Desiree and I am the Young Adults Pastor here. And as you guys can see, I have a very special guest with me. So why don't you tell us who you are and what you do around here? Hey guys, my name is Carl and I'm one of the leaders for the Filipino ministry. Nice, and Carl, how long have you been attending Broadway Church? I've been attending Broadway since I was four years old, since 1995. That's amazing, so that's like maybe 28 years. So you attended Sunday school here when you were a child. I did, and I also have a daughter. I'm looking forward to having her volunteer with me here at Broadway Church. Aw, that's amazing. That is Broadway legacy right there. Well, we have a ton of stuff happening here at Broadway for you and your families. So why don't you check these things out? Speaking of our Filipino ministry, we will be celebrating our 32nd anniversary. It's happening on April 30th at the Vancouver campus from 1 to 3.30 p.m. Tickets are for sale at the Automated Giving Center, so please purchase those as soon as possible, as spots are limited. Happy anniversary to the Filipino ministry. If you're a young adult, you are invited to our monthly service called The Gathering. This is a great place to meet other young adults in our community and get connected. We will be meeting this Thursday, April 27th at 7 p.m. at The Warehouse, which is the building next to the Vancouver campus. Check out the website for more details. We are excited to be hosting six weeks of summer day camps at City Reach's Out of School Care Program. The camps are happening on the weeks of July 3rd to August 11th. Each day is gonna be packed with crafts, games, field trips, and lots of fun activities. The cost is $385 per week per child. And for more information, please check out our website. Please pray for our Mexico short-term missions trip as they leave this upcoming week. Myself and 11 others are going to be serving the children at the Foundation for His Children Ministry Center in Oaxaca, Mexico. Pray for us that God would give us energy and joy as we connect the children, serve well, and show the love of Jesus to others. Our summer kids camp in Vancouver is quickly approaching. This camp is for kids ages four to grade eight. We are hoping to accept 300 children for this camp, but we need your help. Please consider serving with us this summer. Camp is happening July 17th to 21st, and the time commitment is 8 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. You can also choose specific days to volunteer if you can't make it all week. To sign up, visit the kids and family section of the website or email Pastor Megan. We have a preteen event at the Vancouver campus this Friday night, April 28th from 7 to 9 p.m. We're gonna be making bracelets and origami, playing games as well as dodgeball and crab soccer. It's going to be an amazing night. This is open to preteens at all campuses. The cost is $5, so please register your child online under the preteen section of the website. If you missed anything that we said, you can always visit our website, broadwaychurch.com, for more information on all of our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Oh, 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 oh,